Ads heard before, during, or after the podcast are not endorsed by Paranormality Magazine or myself unless voiced by me personally. All other ads are pre-recorded, inserted by ad agencies, and are not under our control. Welcome to Paranormality Magazine. Each week, Paranormality Magazine explores all Fortean subjects, from phantoms to UFOs, and every cryptid creature in between. Each week, you're treated to a collection of well-researched and investigated stories, interviews, and reports on cutting-edge paranormal projects and topics they know you crave. And here in the podcast, I share stories from the magazine to give you just a taste of what you receive in every issue. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Paranormality Magazine. What is it like to feel the presence of a Bigfoot near you? Anthony Tyler sent in his story to Paranormality Magazine. Here's what he wrote. I have a tale for you that my friends say is classified as a textbook Class B Sasquatch encounter. Another way to put it is that I heard a series of wild sounds quite near to me out in the woods, but I didn't catch any sort of visual. Nonetheless, I think it's a very curious encounter that even has a small twist and turn or two, and I'd like to share it with you. But first, allow me to briefly explain some things. I am not a Sasquatch enthusiast exactly, but growing up in Anchorage, Alaska, I certainly found a general interest in the topic, and I've always been a cryptozoology enthusiast. A large part of my interest in these topics stems from my fascination with the mystical or transcendental. For no short amount of time, I have pondered the connection between the archetypal and the cryptozoological, and I've even gone so far as to analyze cryptid encounters similar to how a psychologist would analyze the symbolic components of a dream. I think there is a lot of value to this line of thinking, and as a cherry on top here, I've long since enjoyed posing the question to open-minded people, could someone summon a Bigfoot in the woods if they tried hard enough? Rest assured that as long as someone is open-minded enough to simply enjoy the fun of the question, everyone has an interesting time trying to answer. It was some years after first asking this question that I learned of Native American beliefs regarding what can only be described as Sasquatch, especially in the American Pacific Northwest, and these beliefs lend some credence to this mystical notion of Bigfoot. The hairy archetype always finds itself positioned as a sort of gatekeeper and protector of the wilderness, except in rare cases when it comes across as more nefarious. With that in mind, on the second week of April 2024, I drove from Florida to Georgia to visit some of my family for a long weekend. My girlfriend and I were looking to keep our phones scarce and to just unplug from the daily grind a bit. The part of the family we were visiting is from rural Georgia, and while they've lived in different places for years, they've found themselves back by choice and even more rural than ever before. It's not just kind of folksy, either. They live in the middle of the woods. There's one paved road that leads out and into civilization, eventually, and there are other houses salt and peppered in the woods along with my mother's house on this road, but the closest building to my mother's house is a deer hunting lodge to give some perspective. She has roughly one acre of cleared land with fresh lawn in a circle that the house sits in the center of. The road sits in the front, a trampoline and bonfire sit in the back, and beyond any of that, the rest is dense wilderness. Having only lived here a couple of years, even I forgot just how remote it was. Saturday night, somewhere around 9 or 10 o'clock, me and seven other family members sit around a bonfire in the backyard facing the wilderness. Everyone's talking about this or that, and my stepdad notes how the critters of the night are starting to really chatter. Earlier on, he had mentioned how we'd eventually hear coyotes, owls, wolves, foxes. It just depends on the night. Suddenly, what I can only describe as a whoop and holler pierced through the forest and our conversations. It was so incredibly loud that it silenced both us and the entire wilderness around us in one fell swoop. 
and it couldn't have been more than a hundred yards away from us at most. I immediately recalled some half-baked Sasquatch Hunter TV show that I'd seen in the past where they analyzed some supposed Bigfoot calls. I had no idea what to make of it at the time, but I cataloged it in my brain as something interesting and even striking. On this night, my brain snapped back to that audio clip, and before I could say anything, my stepdad said, well, I'll be damned if that doesn't sound like a Sasquatch. Mind you, this is not only a man who grew up hunting in these very woods. He's a man who grew up in a community that's always upheld its wilderness survival skills. He knows his animal calls in this region, and while he enjoys the idea of Sasquatch, he has never cared much about it before. Beyond that, none of my family from the area had ever heard anything like this animal sound before. I later found that this hoop and holler, which lasted for three seconds or so, is identical to the classical Sierra sounds, which are a series of supposed recorded audio encounters that some hunters had with Bigfoot in the 1970s. But I'll get back to that soon because that's not the end of the encounter. The sound was inhumanly loud and inhumanly pitched, and as a garage band vocalist from years ago, I am familiar with how loud and weird people can truly get if they use techniques. We didn't pack up for the night, we weren't scared, but it did leave an eerie, indelible impression on us all, and when my stepdad and I finally put out the fire at 3 a.m., we heard the second of three sounds. This sound, which came in two intervals and lasted for about four seconds each, is particularly hard to describe, but they were equally as close to us as the earlier hollers. Instead of our left, however, they were coming from the right. They were shrill, sounding like death rattles with a lot of breath behind them, and they crawled up and down in pitch in a way that simply couldn't be mechanical. And of course, aside from this, the rest of the night was dead silent. Since the hoop and holler, the entire forest had remained this way. Unsure what to make of it all and feeling exhausted from a full day, we had yet to connect the sounds. But on Sunday and Monday, we spent at least three hours playing the fantastic recommended tabletop board game Horrified from Ravensburger. And no, this is not a paid sponsorship. I've never spoken to the people that make this game, but I do think it's awesome, and it's a genuine part of this story because this game just so happens to have a clue-type play style that has the players hunting cryptids like Mothman, Chupacabra, the Jersey Devil, and, you guessed it, Bigfoot. One of the family members I was visiting on this trip is my much younger sister, still just a kid, so I was excited to share some cryptid entertainment with her. While we weren't hunting Sasquatch in a board game before we heard the sounds, we were talking about doing it before we heard the sounds. It's also of curious note that on this Monday, which was April 8th, a heavily anticipated solar eclipse occurred, and afterward we played this board game. From our spot in Georgia, we didn't experience anything more than an eerily odd dusk, but I'd say it certainly adds some extra mystique to the whole experience. On Tuesday, my girlfriend and I made the drive back to Florida. It only took me a couple of hours of being home before I did some brief research and learned the name and basic history of the alleged Sasquatch Sierra sounds. You can not only hear these distinct and unique Sasquatch hollers in the recording, but right after them, you could hear the exact death rattleish sounds that we heard hours later in the woods. These recordings, conducted by Al Berry and Ron Moorhead throughout their adventures in the Sierra Nevada mountains during the 1970s, has since become quintessential Bigfoot lore, similar to the Patterson Gimlin film, but in audio form, and honestly a bit more compelling than the footage to me. As for the finer details about the history of the Sierra sounds, I know little, and ultimately this is a bit of a different subject. All I can say is that I heard all these sounds recorded in that collection, aside from the Sasquatch branch-beating sounds that they also captured. By this time in my recounting, hearing the sound recording in my living room and making connections, I was beginning to feel a little foolish for not realizing an opportunity to spend a couple hours Sasquatch hunting. I still feel foolish for that, but it was a weekend meant to spend time with family, and I still hadn't been sure what to make of it all. 
Immediately after hearing these Sierra sounds, I texted the YouTube link to my mother and stepdad to get their opinions. They listened quickly and called me back to deliver me a small twist. Not only did they agree that what we heard matched these recordings exactly, but my mother had heard the whoop and holler yet again just a couple hours earlier that night, again around 9 o'clock. Her fresh, audible encounter provided us with a very unique confirmation that we felt grateful for, quite frankly. I'm also happy to give credit to my stepdad for being the first to make the connection between what I called the death rattles and the second sounds in the recordings. I've been so excited at first that I hadn't even listened to the full audio yet. So I brought a board game about hunting Sasquatch, primed everyone up with some talk about it, and then we heard the sounds. Then we played the game twice more, experienced a full-on solar eclipse, and as soon as I made it home on Tuesday, my mother heard it again, and I got all the confirmation I needed to make me feel like I had missed an opportunity to try my hand at Bigfoot hunting. I don't think I would have found anything, but if nothing else, I would have done it for the story. If they keep hearing sounds, I'll most assuredly make the drive back out there to look around. For now, given the distance, I'm on standby. So did we Jumanji ourselves into a Bigfoot sighting over that weekend? Did my involvement with the mystical and unexplainable, combined with my little sister's genuine childlike fascination and even a solar eclipse, prove to produce what my friend Soraya Asketh calls a poltergeist of the wilderness? I think if we're going down these lines of thought, it's also worth considering that I have lately spent some time on what some would call a prosperity bowl filled with sand and other highly specific items in order to focus my mind and attention on personal prosperity in general. Sasquatch certainly wasn't on my mind with any of this, but maybe it helped with some of the chaos theory of the situation. Whatever truly happened, I leave that for you to decide. But my mind tends to always lean to the transcendental. I'm certain it was not a person in any case, nor was it a common animal or a machine, so either it was a flesh-and-blood Sasquatch or it was a mystical gatekeeper of the wilderness that has physical aspects similar to the aforementioned poltergeist activity. That's my two cents, but then again, I'm just the messenger. So if you ask me, this is a textbook Class B Sasquatch encounter. But it's also a story about how I learned to stress a little less and apparently summon a Sasquatch on accident. If there's one thing I know for sure, though, it's that I would not bet a lot of money on me pulling it off twice. For those of you who've not heard the Sierra sounds before, here is the audio recording. There's a lot of hiss as it was recorded on cassette in 1971. The audio is recorded by Ron Moorhead. At points in the video, the hunters mimic the noises they're hearing. I've cut those out so all you hear are the Sasquatch or Bigfoot noises. Ron and his team wanted scientific validation of the sounds they experienced at the camp, and they submitted their tapes to Dr. R. Lynn Curlin, professor of electrical engineering at the University of Wyoming. The analysis revealed that the sounds were made by a creature physically larger than a man based on pitch and sound, height estimated between 7 foot 3 and 8 feet. There was more than one creature recorded. 
The format frequencies found were clearly lower than human, and their distribution does not indicate that they were a product of human vocalizations or speed alteration. It also concluded that the tape shows no indication of being pre-recorded or re-recorded. Granted, the recording is very loud and noisy due to it being recorded so long ago, 1971, so I've gone back in and I have tried to clean it up a bit using some digital remastering and some noise reduction, and this is what I came up with. Bigfoot or not, it would definitely be something eerie to hear in the middle of the night. So what do you think? Bigfoot or something else? Want more Paranormality? Subscribe to Paranormality Magazine, and each month get it delivered digitally or via mail in our print version. Paranormality Magazine is a collaborative endeavor featuring works from people like you who have a passion for all things mysterious and unexplained. Our goal is the pursuit of knowledge, gathering captivating stories from our own team of writers, researchers, and investigators, as well as from writers such as yourself. Each monthly issue also includes a list of paranormal, horror, UFO, and cryptozoology events around the country incredible paranormal-themed artwork, articles and writing sent in from our readers, suggested books and podcasts to consume, and more. Visit ParanormalityMag.com and subscribe today for as little as $3.99 a month. That's ParanormalityMag.com. ParanormalityMag.com. Werewolves have prowled our nightmares and campfire stories for centuries, but do these mythical man-beasts really walk among us today? John Beale from Paranormality Magazine set out to investigate the history of werewolf legends and search for evidence that lycanthropes still lurk in the shadows. Modern pop culture has embraced the werewolf in movies, TV shows, and books, but global folklore tracing back thousands of years warns people to fear the wolfmen. Ancient Greek myths told of King Lycon being transformed into a ravenous wolf as punishment from Zeus after serving human flesh for dinner. Medieval Europe spun terrifying werewolf yarns to ward off wolves from killing livestock and stalking villages. The infamous Beast of Gévaudan in France reportedly killed over a hundred people from 1764 to 1767. Later, American serial killer Albert Fish disturbingly claimed to have tasted human flesh and felt transformed into a werewolf. These frightening figures keep the werewolf legend alive in our modern consciousness. But does any tangible evidence prove werewolves still walk among us? Sightings persist around the world, from farmers in Argentina reporting livestock slaughtered by upright wolf creatures to night stalkers in London's Hampstead Heath Park, to a hulking canine beast terrorizing a town in Wisconsin. Intriguingly, witnesses often report the same chilling details, like glowing animal eyes, enormous footprints, and spine-tingling howls. Many sightings occur during a full moon, 
lending credence to the myths that werewolves transform beneath its glow. A moon-worshipping cult in Spain, known as the Clan of the Full Moon, even claims lycanthropy gives members superhuman strength and senses. Some paranormal experts theorize werewolves enter a frenzied state on full moon nights if they struggle to control their alter egos. Scientific explanations for perceived werewolf traits offer rational insights into sightings. Conditions like hypertrichosis, which causes abnormal hair growth, or clinical lycanthropy, a psychological condition making sufferers believe they can transform into animals likely fueled historical beliefs in beastly metamorphoses. Other theories suggest witnesses misidentify upright bears or that serial killers don animal skins to camouflage their crimes. Yet questions remain. Why do werewolf legends span so many eras and cultures worldwide? Why do modern sightings share such bizarre similarities? Could a primal, animalistic wildness lurk inside certain people, centuries of repression forcing it to emerge only on nights of the full moon? Or could werewolves be supernatural beings, immune to capture or scientific study? Though inconclusive, the evidence compels us to keep searching for the truth. Werewolves might move among us even now in cities, forests, or even quiet suburban neighborhoods. They could be your co-workers, friends, or family members hiding a terrifying secret. As the world keeps investigating, we urge you all to beware the full moon, listen for howls in the night, and keep silver bullets handy just in case. The wolf men are out there, and they are hungry. Throughout history, there have been many bizarre cases of groups of people and objects mysteriously vanishing without a trace. These unexplained disappearances continue to captivate the public imagination and baffle experts. Here, we'll dive into some of the most fascinating examples of vanishings that remain completely unsolved mysteries to this day. One of the earliest and most puzzling is the 16th century disappearance of the Roanoke Colony in what is now North Carolina. In 1587, over 100 English settlers landed on Roanoke Island, intent on establishing the first permanent British colony in the New World. The colony was funded by Sir Walter Raleigh and led by Governor John White. After struggling with supplies and relations with local Native American tribes, White sailed back to England in late 1587 to get more resources but White was unable to return until 1590 due to the attack of the Spanish Armada. When he finally did make it back, there was no trace left of the colony or its inhabitants besides the mysterious word Croatoan carved into a tree. Despite many theories exactly what happened to the group of over 100 men, women, and children remains an impenetrable mystery over 400 years later. Jumping ahead to the 1920s, we have the baffling disappearance of Percy Fawcett into the depths of the Amazon rainforest. A British artillery officer turned explorer, Fawcett became obsessed with legends of an ancient lost city in the jungle that he named Z. In 1925, he set out from Brazil with his eldest son Jack and his friend Raleigh Rommel on an expedition to finally locate the city. But the three adventurers vanished in the jungle setting off countless rescue missions and rumors. Despite indigenous tribes claiming Fawcett was killed by an Amazonian tribe, many believe the ancient city Fawcett sought did exist and hope it will be uncovered one day. Moving to the United States in the 1930s, we have the shocking prison escape of criminal Richard Loeb. Loeb and his friend Nathan Leopold were two wealthy University of Chicago students who murdered a 14-year-old boy in 1924 just to prove they could commit the quote-unquote perfect crime. Both received life sentences for the killing. Then in 1936, Loeb was stabbed over 40 times by a fellow inmate and died. Or did he? Some claim he actually survived and escaped prison. 
Years later, people reported Loeb was living in New York and working as a lab tech under an assumed name. However, the real fate of Loeb remains murky to this day. Besides individuals, there have also been many cases of entire communities and vessels disappearing under unexplained circumstances. Take, for instance, the baffling case of Anjakuni Village in Canada's far north. In 1930, a fur trapper named Joe LaBelle walked into an Inuit village of igloos on the shores of Lake Anjakuni, expecting a warm welcome. But strangely, the village was completely deserted. All he found were overturned pots of food, weapons, and sled dog carcasses that had died of starvation. There was no sign of where any of the 30 villagers had gone. Despite rumors of alien abduction or government relocation, what truly happened at Anjakuni Village has never been determined. Nearly 15 years later, during World War II, a similarly bizarre mass vanishing occurred right in the United States. In December 1945, George and Jenny Sauter and nine of their ten children were asleep at their West Virginia home when a fire broke out. George, Jenny, and four of the children escaped, but the other five were never seen again. An investigation found no cremated remains, and the ladder on the home's side was missing. The Sauters believed that their children had been kidnapped before the fire and searched tirelessly for decades but no trace of the missing Sauter siblings has ever surfaced. The open ocean is the setting for another unsolved group disappearance, that of the SS Waratah in 1909. This 500-foot steamship sailed for Australia for London on July 1st with 212 passengers and crew aboard. After stopping in South Africa July 26th, the ship headed out across the Indian Ocean towards its next stop in Australia, but was never heard from again. No distress signals were received despite the Waratah having advanced wireless communication for its time. Documents later surfaced indicating the ship may have been structurally top-heavy, but no wreckage was ever found, leaving the ultimate fate of all those on board the Waratah an ongoing mystery. While we may never know for certain what happened in these peculiar cases, they continue to intrigue each new generation. As science and technology progresses, new evidence may surface that can unravel some of these age-old mysteries. But until then, vanishing colonies, mutated prisoners, abandoned villages, and disappeared ships serve as strange and unsettling reminders that some secrets of history still remain in the shadows. For now, we can only speculate about logical explanations and perhaps some more fanciful theories. The unknown fates of vanished individuals, groups, and objects will likely haunt us forever. But perhaps someday, through luck or advanced technology, new evidence will surface to finally provide answers in these cold cases. Until then, we will continue to speculate and theorize endlessly about what truly happened. The surreal stories of unexplained vanishings lost to history keep our curiosity fresh and our sense of wonder strong. Thanks for listening to Paranormality Magazine. Get more information about the magazine and subscribe to our monthly publication at ParanormalityMag.com. That's ParanormalityMag.com, or click the link in the show description. And if you're a researcher or investigator, send us your stories. We might feature you in our next issue. If you have a paranormal podcast, you can add it to our website so our readers can find your show. And artists, if you'd like your work to be featured in our magazine or on our back cover, contact us. Again, our website is ParanormalityMag.com. I'm Darren Marlar and I'll have more Paranormal for you next time from Paranormality Magazine.